Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this special event, the Indiana Jones of Art. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Head of Education at JW3. In March 2020, within a week, we had to move our adult education sessions out of the building and onto what we became affectionately known as Zoom. And that's how it's been for the last 18 months until September when we moved back into the building, joining up with Arts and Culture and the Family and Communities Programme. And it's lovely to be back in the building. The difference to pre-COVID is that we're now running 90% hybrid so that those online can still join in and those who want to come into the building can be in the classroom. Um, tonight, we're totally online, as with our, all our other international sessions, and we're delighted to welcome you to, li to listen to two exceptional people. As we're on a platform that does not enable questions, please send them to me at questions at jw3.org.uk. That's questions at jw3.org.uk. So tonight we're going to meet the world's greatest art detective, Arthur Brand, an intriguing personality, a Dutch art crime investigator whose vocation is being an art historian and art consultant. Our interviewer this evening is the well-known Patrick Bade, someone who we've often had at JW3 and before that at the LJCC, an art expert, an author, a lecturer and a broadcaster who for many years taught at Christie's in London. Our thanks this evening to the Genesis Philanthropy Group for their support. And now to the event itself, and it's my pleasure to hand over now to Patrick Bade. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. And uh, the, uh, the first thing I want to say about this book is that it is the most incredible page turner. Um, uh, you won't have any trouble uh, getting through it uh, at uh, uh, speed. It, it reads like a thriller, and uh, I, I kept thinking, wow, this would just make uh, such a, a good movie. And I gather that you already have a, a, is it an offer or a contract with MGM for a movie? Yes, MGM uh, contacted me. I first thought it to be a joke, you know, as a simple Dutch guy, um, MGM calling, the guys who make James Bond. So I first thought it to be a joke, but uh, then they called again and uh, yes, they bought the rights to make a movie or a series uh, from this uh, from this book. So I'm, yeah, I was flabbergasted, of course. Well, I, I wondered if you'd actually uh, written it with um, a, a movie in mind because it, it, it has all the ingredients. Yes, um, you know, when this whole story developed, I knew at a certain moment, I thought, what am I doing? I'm, I'm chasing back Hitler's favorite statues, thought to be lost for 75 years. And, and at a certain moment, I realized I was lying in bed and I realized, my God, if I succeed, um, this is going to be world news, you know, and uh, maybe a movie will be made out of it. it. It felt like a movie, you know, this whole... This whole search, it was the, the characters I encountered. It, it was like a movie. So at a certain point, I realized um, this might be a movie someday. Well, that's one of the things that I really like about the book is it is such a vivid collection of uh, characters. And uh, uh, I also have uh, one of the things I find really uh, uh, sympathetic is that you seem to have a certain sympathy or liking for all these characters. I mean, some of them are quite nasty, quite uh, sinister or, or menacing, but they're very rounded characters. Uh, it, 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 they're very real. Yeah, well, it's it's like when you when you watch a movie, you see spies, you see um, uh, criminals, um, uh, kingpins, etc., and then. One day it that happened to me, you are in the midst of it yourself. So when I started this investigation, you meet people. Um, you must also understand a normal person would not do the job I do. Why should he, he or she? Um, normal people are not involved in, in, in crime, in art crime. So um, the people who choose for those jobs are, of course, um, I'm included um, a little crazy, you know, it's not a thing normal people would do. So 
of course, the people you met during these these searches in in, in my field. Well, they are, you know, I meet artists. Uh, have you ever found a painter who is normal? You know, um, they always have something. If not, you cannot be an artist. So uh, the people that collect art are pop stars, are royals. So um, the people I encounter are standard, not um, ordinary. So in this search, well, yes, it, it was a secret, a, a secret um, hidden for 75 years, uh, Hitler's favorite statues. People try to, to hide it. So, yeah, I encountered people, ex-spies, uh, KGB, the, the former secret Russian service, um, former Stasi members. Um, Stasi was the East German secret service. So, um, yes, the characters I encountered were um, sometimes larger than life. There are lots of great um, sort of cameo roles, I think, for uh, famous actors. But who's going to play you? That's the big question. Who would you like to play you? Well, Have you thought about that? No, yes. Well, I, I was um, when I started my job, um, I was a student and I had no idea about a world of art and crime. Um, according to the FBI, art crime is the third largest criminal enterprise in the world. You must think about uh, groups like the IRA, the Mafia, Hezbollah, terrorist groups, narcos. They are all involved. So I'm moving in a world where um, on one hand you have the rich co collectors like uh, royals, movie stars. And on the other hand, you have the high-end criminals. So I'm moving in that world. And I was thought this job, if you can call it a job because you cannot study it anywhere, by a Dutchman who lived at the time in London, Michel van Rijn, who, according to Scotland Yard, was responsible for 90% of the art crime in the world. And he also wanted us to believe that he was responsible for the other 10%. Can you imagine? A normal criminal denies everything. But he admitted the 90%, but also exaggerated to try us to believe that he was also involved in the rest. So... He taught me this, this, this job. And, and from the first day, I was involved with people like the FBI, with Scotland Yard, with forgers, um, you know, with, with the rich of the rich. And Michel Van Rijn once said to me, Arthur, you will see that one day you won't go to the cinema anymore because with me, you will be living it. And that was true. It was a combination of James Bond, Indiana Jones, um, the Da Vinci Code with, with this guy, I forgot his name. Uh, but anyway, so it's hard to say who's going to play me because, to be honest, I don't watch movies anymore. It's um, The other day I had to um, watch Hollywood movies for an interview uh, about art thefts and I had to criticize them uh, if they were real and... Um, they are not very realistic. So as you are living this world, you cannot watch movies anymore. So I don't know that many actors. So if you have a suggestion for me, um, I will be fine. Well, I think we should uh, ask the audience at the end to nominate their, 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 their suggestions. But uh, I mean, there, there is uh, one of the things in the book is that uh, 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 the there is really a sense or that you were in uh, or you seem to feel in the book you were in physical danger on numerous occasions and there were so many people who actually uh, could have threatened you you know uh, 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 nazis uh, 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 neo nazis uh, ex stasi uh, and so on uh, with hindsight what do you feel like that now well you know and uh, Michel van Rijn called me at the time and he showed me a picture and he said, Arthur, um, I was contacted by someone who said there is a, a Nazi family who tries to sell something secretly. And this is the picture. And I looked at the picture and I saw the Thorak horses. The Thorak horses were Hitler's favorite statues. He had placed them underneath his window in the Reichschancellery. But these statues were uh, supposed to be destroyed during the, the raid of, of Berlin, the, the Battle of Berlin. So they should be fakes. So um, from that moment on, uh, I thought they were fakes. And then 
at a certain moment, um, I was watching a documentary about the final days of the Third Reich. I think everybody knows these, this footage. It's Hitler who was hiding in the bunker in the garden of the Reichstanslery uh, in March 45. For the last time, he leaves the bunker and he sees his last soldiers, uh, children of 40, 14, 15 years, and he puts their medals on. And I was watching that and I thought, this is the place where these horses are supposed to stand. It was just before the Battle of Berlin started. But I watched, and this footage I, I've watched a hundred times. I think everybody has seen them. They are on every documentary about the Third Reich. And on the spot where one of the horses should have been standing, there was somebody, a guard, Hitler's guard standing. So the horses were not there. So in that moment, I realized maybe the horses on the color picture that, that Michel Ryan got, who passed it on to me, were the real ones. And from that moment on, I started to investigate who can be offering these famous statues, these Hitler's favorite uh, sculptures on the black market. And then, as you said, I soon found out it was a world, a secret world of, of rich collectors, um, people with Nazi sympathies, old Nazis, neo-Nazis, uh, KGB spies, um, Stasi spies. So, yes, I, I, I entered a world, a secret world with um, people who have murdered before. So um, I realized they would not be very happy that I would un reveal their, their secret that they were trying to, to make money out of um, memorabilia, statues, art of the Third Reich. So yes, in, in some occasions, I when I read my own book back, and, and we have filmed a lot for a documentary too, and, and when I look it back, I sometimes think um, if I would have thought it better, I might have skipped some, some meetings that I had because in hindsight, it was dangerous yes and uh, you uh, many times in the book you you mention this um, very sinister organization called uh, Stille Hilfe uh, could you tell us something about that yeah that's amazing story we all know um, Frederick Forsyth his uh, his book about a secret Nazi organization. He wrote it, Odessa. And Odessa should have been an organization of Nazi, uh, Nazis at the end of the war who helped other Nazis, Mengele, Eichmann, escape to Argentina, etc. But we all now know that foresight exaggerated. There was not a real group. Odessa did not exist. But there was another organization, what is called uh, Silent uh, Help, Stille Hilfe. And that organization really exists. It's a German organization that started somewhere around 46, 47. And they really helped people escape Germany. They also helped people, Nazis who were on the run, they helped them um, to keep on the run. Whenever one of them was caught um, and extradited to, to Germany or whatever country, they provided money to pay their lawyers. So... It's a secret organization, and I soon found out that the people who were trying to offer these Hitler horses on the market, that they somehow were related to this group. So I started to investigate this group, and I found out something very interesting. And the interesting thing was that the, more or less the leader of Stille Hilfe was a woman named Gudrun Burwitz. And the name Burwitz probably doesn't ring a bell, but her maiden name is Gudrun Himmler. She was the daughter of Heinrich Himmler, the second in command of the Third Reich, the SS, um, the head of the SS. So um, I found out that um, this, this woman, um, Gudrun Burwitz, was somehow involved, at least in Stille Hilfe, but all the people all the names I found out during my search, trying to find all these statues, were somehow related to Stille Hilfe. So someday I went to Munich because I, I couldn't believe that the daughter of Himmler was still alive. And I went to Munich, I found out where she lived, and I waited for her to, to enter her home. It was an old woman. And um, 
I encountered her and I told her if I asked her if she knew anything um, about this. And I asked her, where does Steely Hill forget their money from? But she refused to talk to me and uh, she just said some things and uh, then she went away. But um, yes, even um, Stiele Hilfe turned out to be involved in this, in the selling of the, the statues. I think we lost Patrick. Hi, yes, we have lost him. Uh, we did worry that that might happen with the, the internet in uh, where he's living today. So um, just uh, take us back, take us back, Arthur, to the beginning. Yeah, well, um, as, I told, as I told already, I got this uh, photograph of, of Hitler's horses. You know, these three meter high bronze horses were not just horses, you know, um, they were Hitler's favorites. He put them under his um, office in, in the garden of in the Reichs Chancellery. And I always called them the horses that saw everything because 20 meters to the left of these horses, uh, World War II was declared in Hitler's office. And 20 meters to the other side of the horses was the bunker in the garden of the Reichs Chancellery. So, where Hitler committed suicide together with Eva Brown. So in a circle of, of 50 meters around these horses, World War II ended, uh, started and ended. So they, are, they have a very symbolic meaning. And I saw this picture and I, I told before that we first thought them to be fakes until I saw this documentary, this last footage of Adolf Hitler. And I realized they might still exist. So then is when I started my investigation. So I realized that Hitler probably, because they were not seen on the last footage, probably had removed these horses from the Reichstagsensory to a secret place. So I started investigating and in archives in Germany because we think we know everything about World War II. But um, there are miles of archives in Germany, which are still not investigated. So I find out that indeed Hitler, just before the Battle of Berlin had started, had moved these horses to the northern part of Berlin. When the Russians came, the Russians uh, confiscated these horses. And um, when Hitler was defeated, one should have thought these statues would have been destroyed. But it turned out that Stalin, also a dictator, in this case, a, a communist dictator, really loved these statues. Um, one of Hitler's favorite uh, sculptors, uh, Arno Breker, was uh, contacted after the war by Stalin. And Stalin said, look, Mr. Breker, you worked for Adolf Hitler. You made these fantastic statues. I love them a lot. Would you like to work for me? And Breker said, well, I work for one dictator, I think that should be enough. But it shows that Nazi art was also loved by the communists. There was not so much difference between communist art and, and Nazi art. So what happened then is that uh, Stalin ordered the statues to be, to be um, guarded, not to destroy them. And they put them secretly on a Russian base in Eastern Germany, where they stayed till 89. And then in 89, some people with Nazi sympathies in the West, I have to be careful uh, how to call them, but let's call them people with Nazi sympathies, found out that these horses, Hitler's favorite statues, were still, uh, they still existed. So they contacted the Russians. Imagine people, neo Nazis, old Nazis, contacting communists. And they made a deal. And the deal was that they secretly transported all these statues from Eastern Germany over the wall to the West. And there they were hidden by these people for 30 years in a secret basement. So that's the story, more or less, how it, uh, what happened with, with these uh, statues. Yeah, am I, I? Can you hear me now? Am I back again? I yeah, hope yeah. I'm back. Am I? Yeah, fully uh, back, I just want to. 
uh, actually pick up a little bit on uh, uh, the, where we left off, which was uh, Stille Hilfe, because uh, you make a statement in the book. I mean, I almost dropped the book when I when when I read the statement, which was that you uh, you say that Stille Hilfe actually was in a way protected by all the different political parties in Germany. Can, can oh, you say yes. a bit uh, more about that? Yes. Um, Stille Hilfe um, was, it's, it's a strange thing because uh, Stille Hilfe on one hand was um, helped a bit by secret uh, Stasi agents because they wanted to stir up um, the bad reputation of the West. They would say, look, there is still still uh, Stille Hilfe in Western Germany. You see, there are still Nazis. And they were helped by um, some forces within the German government, politicians, um, judges, um, with Nazi sympathies. And you must understand, after the war, many of the former uh, Nazis, especially those in high ranks, just passed on to the new formed uh, democratic German, uh, the Bundesrepublik Deutschland. So judges and policemen and politicians who were who had high ranks in the Nazi era, they just passed on to the democratic state um, for the, at least for 20 years. In, in the 60s, people started to realize that something was wrong. You know, how can you have been a judge under Hitler and be a, a judge now, still nowadays? You know, so um, a lot of these old comrades um, protected Stille Hilfe. Some of them did it because they felt obliged. They were their old friends. But there were also other people um, who were not that much into, into Nazi ideology, but they thought it would be bad publicity for, um, for the German state if they would still be talking about World War II. So, yes, Stille Hilfe have been helped by, um, by politicians from, from all parties, not only from, from the Christian Democrats, but also from the FPD, uh, from the socialists. So... Um, they had uh, sympathizers in, in all layers of German uh, society. Uh, can we talk a bit about um, the the artist, Josef uh, Torak? Uh, uh, he was, as you've said, one of the two um, really official artists. I mean, he had a particular thing about sculpture. I think it meant more to him than, than painting because he had a great thing about architecture as well. So, uh, do you think that Josef Torak was really uh, um, a, a, a believing Nazi or was he just an opportunist? Completely an opportunist. Um, most of these sculptors, these artists, were already artists before Hitler came to power. And you must understand, in, in, in the beginning of the 30s, um, we now know what Hitler was planning, but at the time... Uh, I have, I work for a lot of Jewish families to, to try to help them recover art stolen by the Nazis. And when you read these histories of these, these families, there were also Jewish people there in Germany still believing in, in 35, 36, 37, that things would not be that bad. So when Thorak and Breker signed for Hitler, um, they were just opportunists. Uh, Hitler gave them money to work and they took it and of course it was bad you know you should never work for a dictator but even nowadays i sometimes criticize um, we have architects english architects uh, dutch architects who make buildings in china you know these days um china is a dictator is a is a dictatorial state too so it's very hard to say that all these people were really bad people, you know. They were bad in the sense that they were opportunists. You know, they didn't have any uh, problems with well, one, working. Yeah, one of the and, stories that you... So it's going to say one of the stories you tell, which I found very uh, fascinating, is the story of uh, 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 Josef Torak's first wife and what happened to her and their child. Yes, it's, it's a very strange story. Um, what happened is Hitler asked 
Thorak, I want you to be my favorite sculptor. So then Thorak said, well, there is a slight problem. My wife is Jewish. So Hitler said, well, we will talk about that later. So Goering um, offered Thorak because Goering once said, I decide who is Jew or not. Goering sometimes um, gave Jewish people a pass when they were important. So Thorak could have asked Goering to... Um, to go along with this, to, that, that uh, Torah could stay with his wife. But he didn't do that. He divorced his wife. So after the war, um, Torah was criticized for that. They say, you were married to a Jewish woman. Um, Hitler offers you a job. You divorced this woman and you didn't even try to convince Goring to, um, to, to give it a pass. So he was criticized a lot for this. Later, I find out that um, it was not the way it looked because Torak divorced her, but he kept seeing he kept seeing her. Uh, I encountered pictures of the two together after their divorce in 37, 38. She accompanied um, Torak to um, some art exhibition in France. So um, it turned out that for the public view, he was divorced, but in the end, he wasn't, you know, they were still together. So when I found out, and, and I described that in my book, when I found that out, I thought, you know, it's not all black and white. Um, we can criticize Torak, we can criticize Breaker that they made art for Adolf Hitler, um, but um, it's not always black and white because, you know, Many people in the 30s in Germany had to continue their job, you know. Um, the new situation was the Nazis were in power. Everybody thought it will be, not be that bad. So everybody went along. And at a certain point, when most Germans started to realize, my God, this is not going to end well. Uh, people are getting killed. Um, some people heard about concentration camps, uh, the bombardments. I think for many people, it was too late to step out. You know, it's it's easy to criticize in hindsight all these people. But I refuse to believe that these 20, 30, 40 million Germans were all bad people. You know, a big part was bad, but there was also a part um, who just was caught in the middle, you know, um, so... And, and I think Torak was one of them. Um, of course, he did bad things, but I think he most likely was an opportunist and not really a convinced Nazi. I think it's very interesting that he didn't actually join the party until 1941, that's very late, uh, and that apparently Hitler um, uh, uh, faked it so that it looked like he joined in 33 because it was embarrassing to him that his, one of his favorite artists had taken so long to join the party. Exactly. But th there were more examples. Um, Hitler, as we all know, um, Hitler was an artist himself, not a very good one, but um, he appreciated art. and But only um, realistic art. Uh, he didn't like modern art. He called it de degenerated art. He said modern art is made by Jews, by homosexuals and by communists, and they want to overthrow the the, the 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 real German uh, people. So he prohibited this um, this kind of, of of art. But it it there were strange moments because uh, Munch, the famous um, artist, um, Goebbels had said that Munch was the perfection of the Aryan uh, artist. And then Hitler said, no, he's degenerate. So for one day or the other on the other day, Goebbels had to declare. Munk from now on is degenerate. So it was really, it was really a crazy time. So um, it it was hard for for people like like all these artists. What what do I do? Do I continue to make modern art and I might get shot? Do I stop working? But what can I do if I stop working? I might have to join the army and get shot at the Eastern Front. Or do I just do my work and make the art the Nazis want? And, and I think that's an important issue to, to tell. Um, what makes these horses and, and, and all these statues that we, we recovered? Because in the end, it turned out we didn't only recover the, the, 
the bronze horses, we recovered almost all statues that adorned the Reichschancellery. It, it turned out that half of the Reichschancellery still existed, somewhere hidden in, in Nazi circles. Um, but anyway, uh, not for the, uh, art for the Nazis was not just art. Art for the Nazis was propaganda. And it's not only the Nazis who do that. Um, I think all dictatorial regimes use uh, art as propaganda. I always say to people, if you go to a country you never went before, a faraway country, and you step out of the airplane and you see a statue of the, the president of that country and that statue is 10 or 50 meters high, you better get the hell out of it because you might understand what kind of people, what kind of, of country it is, you know? So I think it's very important that this art, these sculptures, that this Nazi art should be studied. And we, have, we haven't done that for 70 years. And since we rediscovered we, we the horses, um, they will go on public display next year. <coughs> The German state has said um, we should show them to the public. It's it's about time now to do this. And I think it's very important because dictatorial art, and that's Nazi art, it's communist art, it's fascist art, was the second most important um, uh, kind of art of the 20th century. It, it defined that whole century. So I think it's very important that we start to study this art. It shows us how the Nazis and, and other dictators use art as propaganda. It's not just art for them. And I think that's why, and I try to, to, to show that in my book too, it's, it's more than just art. To give you a, a simple example, the Nazis started uh, to call this modern art degenerated. So every modern art was uh, declared uh, prohibited. So the Nazis made um, exhibitions and they showed this degenerate art and next to them they showed photographs of disabled people and they say, look, so do you see the similarities? This is what these painters want us to show and this is these disabled people, people who are um, insane or whatever. And they say, we don't want that on our paintings. But figure, this started already in the 1930s the early 1930s. So the Nazis started to say certain people we don't want to be portrayed on paintings anymore, on art. That's where it started. They don't, we, we are not allowed to see them, to portray them anymore. And of course it ended in the concentration camps. They were not allowed to live anymore. So this whole art idea of the Nazis, it was all part of the plan. It, it started with art, with propaganda, and it ended with the concentration camp. So that's the reason I think it's very important that these statues survived and that we can finally see them and that we, we get interest in, in, in Nazi art, in dictatorial art, because as said, it's a fundamental part of the Nazis. You cannot understand that their uh, way to power, their way of, of brainwashing the, the German public without art. You must understand there was no television at the time, there was no internet, so it was art that the Nazis used to, to brainwash um, the Germans, which ended in the end so badly. Do you think that um, the Torah courses have any um, inherent aesthetic merit? And is it possible to uh, separate that uh, from all, uh, all, everything you've been talking about, the, the, the propaganda, the, the, uh, 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 you know, the historical and political associations? Well, I always say um, I did this investigation together with um, a German journalist from the Spiegel and together with a, a German a police officer. And we had this discussion, the three of us. And, and the German journalist said, I hate these statues. They are so typical Nazi art. The policeman said to me, he whispered and I said, I really like them. And I said, that's not a problem. You know, they are just horses. You can like them. If that's your taste, you like them. When I give lectures, um, 
I sometimes show a painting and I say to, to the crowd, let's say 500 people, I say, do you like this painting? And then two, 300 arms are going up. And then I say, this painting was made by Adolf Hitler. So all these hands go down, you know, and I said, relax. If you like a painting that doesn't make you a Nazi, you know. So um, one of the, I know a guy who collects these kind of art and who is studying it. And he is, um, I would call him from the far left. So, but he loves this art because it's, it's not so much about the art. It's about um, the historical signif significance of, of these statues. You know, it's, it's what, I, what I just said before. It, it teaches us something. It teaches us something that how can it be that in a country that a, a, a civilized country like Germany can end up doing all these bad things and we should try to, to, to pin that down. We should try to understand that it should not happen again. And art is one of those, um, one of those things that the Nazis use. So I think um, when you look at Nazi art, there are paintings um, of a family, you know. Um, there's nothing wrong with this. Um, many of these statues that the Nazis made are very similar to the Roman statues, to the Greek statues, these strong fighters with, with uh, swords, etc. And I always tell people, you might like it or not, but it doesn't make you a Nazi. Um, the only thing is, it should not be destroyed. Um, some people ask me, should this art be destroyed? And I said, no, no, please no, because you know who destroyed art, you know? It was Stalin, it was Hitler. ISIS is destroying art. You don't want to be in that list. You should not destroy art. You cannot erase history. You cannot pretend that his, uh, World War II wasn't there. And, and the most important thing I think is to, to put these things on display is boys and girls at 10, 12 years old who you want to teach about this dark history, this, this dark era, um, for them, history should be touchable, visible. Um, they shouldn't only be reading about it. You should be able to see it. You should go into a museum and see these statues and that your teacher or somebody else explains to you, look, this is Nazi art. This is how it started. You see, it's so big because they thought big. Uh, everything should be big. Um, on, on, on Nazi paintings, you see only healthy people. Um, why did the Nazis do that? Um, why did they show so many soldiers? Why did they show families with three, four children? Because they wanted women to get a lot of children because Hitler needed soldiers. So I think to get young people to interest, to get interested in, in this dark era, to, to get new historians who will study it, you need to make it visible um, for these youngsters. Well, also for us, of course, but the more elderly people, but... It, it's strange. I once had, a, uh, as I told you before, I, I work for Jewish families and uh, the grandson of one of them once traveled from Israel to Germany. He wanted to see what remained of World War II because his whole life he, he had heard talking about it. And he called me from Germany and I said, there was not much left. The, the Germans destroyed everything. You know, um, I don't like that. He said, they, they want to erase it. And I said, no, no, that's not the case. Germany was, um, um, how do you say it? They were shamed. They were ashamed to what had they have done. So they tried to erase everything. But that's not the way, you know. You should see, when you go to a museum, you see Roman statues. You see um, things about Napoleon or whatever. You should see something about the Third Reich. Um, in 2,000 years, these horses and other statues will still be, the public still want, want it to, to be seen. And I always give the, the best example, I think, is, is Auschwitz. We all know that at the end of the war, um, they wanted to, to destroy Auschwitz um, after the war because they say it's such a bad place, we should erase it. And some people said, no, 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 don't do it. Let it be like it is because future generations should go there to see that it really happened. And I think... It's not only Auschwitz, but also um, all these things like art. I think they should be on display. Of course, you should explain. You, you cannot just put them on display. You should put 
um, cards with it. You should explain what it is. But I think it's very important to not let this happen again, you know, that people keep on studying what went wrong in, in the last century. Well, by and large, I think I, I do agree with you. I, I, in fact, I'm fully with you on this, although I can see there are certain dangers. And as you say, you've got, it, they've got to be put in a context and they've got to be explained. But uh, of course, it's a, an incredible irony that these things are just, as you say, they're about to go on display just at a time where uh, in Britain, I'm sure it's happening in Holland too, uh, and all over the Western world, statues are being uh, toppled and destroyed and hid hidden uh, and uh, uh, hidden and there is this great movement to um, re remove statues of slavers and imperialists do, do you have thoughts about that oh absolutely um, I can fully understand fully understand that some statues if you are um, if you are a descendant of slaves you don't want to see a statue in the middle of the town of somebody who, who sold your grandparents or, or your great great grandparents so I fully understand that, that some of these statues should be removed, but don't destroy them. They should be put in a museum. You should learn from it. You cannot destroy history. You cannot destroy art. You can uh, quit them from public display, from 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 a um, you know from from a square. They shouldn't be there. I fully understand that, but. They, they do not only want to remove them, they also want to destroy them. They try to, to cut them in two, and, and that's not the way, you know. Hitler, Stalin, ISIS, they destroyed art. You don't want to be in that list. You can't remove them, but put them in a museum and show the people, look, the people who, who sold slaves at the time thought it, it was normal. They even, they even erased statues for these people. Nowadays, we look at totally different. You cannot understand, you cannot learn from history if we destroy everything, if we destroy everything from World War II, if we destroy everything from this, this era which you just talked about. So I think it's very important to, to, to keep them. And I said, not on public display on a square. That's, of course, would be too much. You know, it's, they should not be there anymore, but put them in a museum. Um, if we if we would continue doing that, we should er erase all the statues by the, the Roman emperors. Uh, they were dictators. They they killed hundreds of thousands of people. Um, we know that, but we also want to study their art. We also wanted to study what how, how did they how did they think? Uh, how was it possible that they were dictators? That they were so cruel? How could it be that that a Roman emperor could kill a hundred thousand people and then was celebrated as a hero, you know? And I think that for that reason, these statues where you just were talking about should be removed, but they should not be uh, destroyed. And sadly it happens. Well, I think it's so true. Uh, true. I mean, uh, when I, I go to uh, Munich, uh, walking into the Haus der Kunst gives me an, an incredible sense of the oppressiveness of the uh, Nazi regime. It's the scale, it's what you were talking about earlier, everything being too big to make you feel small. And that's a very, um, uh, you know, strong sensation you can get from it. Yeah, and, and I said, if you if you see this, this kind of architecture in other countries, um, if, if you look at Saddam Hussein, if you look at Syria, um, if you look at dictatorial regimes, everywhere they have the same kind of art. You know, it's not just a statue of two meters high. No, it's a statue of 10 meters high. So um, it, it's, you should not destroy it. You can learn from it. As you just said, at Haus der Kunst, one of the Hitler's horses was displayed there uh, in, in 39 uh, at the Kunstausstellung. Um, and, you know, this architecture is architecture. Um, a building cannot be wrong, you know what I mean? A building does not have blood on its hands. It's a building. If you don't like it, destroy it. But um, if it's a neutral building, although a little bit high, um, I think it's a good way to, to show to the public, look, once we had the Nazis here, this was the Haus der Kunst. They only placed Nazi art here. Look, my fellow man, nowadays it's a museum for modern art. 
the art that Hitler hated. That's the perfect solution. They turned this building into a museum, not for Nazi art, but for the art, modern art that Hitler so much hated. So I think that's the way you should um, do these things. Good. Well, I think that's probably a, a, a point where we could, uh, I seem to have lost all the uh, uh, questions on chat. So I don't know if uh, uh, I may, uh, one has just popped up. Yeah, uh, I saw one of them. And it says, are you involved, your, are you, can you see the questions? Can you see the questions? Yeah, no, I saw Would you one like to answer that one? Yeah, uh, if I was involved, if I am involved in putting them on public display, um, no, in fact, I haven't even seen the horses yet. Um, when the raid, in, in a certain stage, I had the names of the people who could have been involved in hiding these statues. So I involved the German police and they did one of the biggest raids in German history. I describe it in my book, the last chapter. Um, 200 police officers raided a few homes in, in Germany. But I was not allowed to be there because I was... A state witness. So I was sitting at home in the Netherlands on the telephone and they called me and I said, we haven't found anything yet. We only found a torpedo, a V1 rocket, but not the horses. So I was sweating because I thought if they don't find them, um, I look like a fool. My career has ended, but finally they found them. And from that moment on, I have been called by a lot of uh, museum directors in Germany and they said, Mr. Brandt, can you help us um, get these horses? If they are allowed to go on display, can you help us to put it in our museum? I said, look, I haven't even seen them myself. So you should probably call uh, Angela Merkel. So um, no, I'm not involved in anything uh, of, on putting them on display, but I do support it, of course. Did you spend a lot of time in Germany? Oh, I spent, during this, this uh, research, I, I went from Munich to Berlin. I, I was put on, um, you know, I had to, to dig into this secret world of, that's another funny thing. Um, I, I teamed up with, with an, an elderly woman, which I found out later that in the 70s and 80s, she had worked for the, the, the Stasi, the East German Secret Service. So she was a communist. And she was involved in selling Nazi art because um, in the 70s and 80s, the, the Eastern Germany uh, needed hard currency. And they found out that all these Nazi statues that they had confiscated, that there was a market for in the West, all Nazis who wanted to have them. So the, the communists started to secretly sell these statues to the West, to, to, to collectors there. So imagine communists selling statues to old Nazis in the West. So I encountered all these people. They put me on, on false leads. So I traveled from Munich to Berlin to Dresden. So I crossed the entire Germany to, to pin down these places where these horses and all these other statues could be hidden. Wow. Um so there's a few other questions. Let, let's take this one. Um, you seem to be a very cheerful person. You come over as being very positive. Um, but a lot of the work is quite depressing. I and mean, this is people doing horrible things. They're faking art. They're hiding art. They're stealing art. Uh, how do you manage to say so positive? Well, to be honest, um, you know, when, when I go after Hitler's horses, it took like a couple of years. And you never know in the beginning that in the end you will be successful. So it's very depressing. You encounter people who are only in it for the money. Imagine that I found out that communists were doing deals with Nazis. It's so crazy, you know. So it, it's, it gets depressing. And But in the end, um, every time during a search, I say to myself, it, it's so much blood, sweat and tears. And, and you never know if you're going to succeed. So you get depressed. Um, and every time I say, this will be my last search. But then in the end... When you have a Picasso recovered worth 70 million, I put one on my on the wall one night. If you have the ring of Oscar Wilde, which was stolen, which I recovered, you have it for two weeks on your finger. Um, when you recover Hitler's horses, you know, at that moment you forget everything from 
all the blood, sweat and tears. And these few days that you have such an, a stolen piece of art in your possession before you hand it over to the police, you know, it's, it's magic. It's really magic. So every time I say after this one, I stop, but then I get a lead to something very interesting. And I said, let's go for it for the last time. Uh, I, I was actually. I'd like to ask you a question as well, because I remember when the uh, 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 the incredible uh, excitement when those horses were discovered. It was in all the papers. Everybody was uh, talking about it, and then suddenly it turned out there was a third horse that had been on full display in the school courtyard in Bavaria all those years, and nobody had even noticed it. Uh, it's ridiculous. Uh, it's ridiculous. Uh, what yeah. happened was that um, just after the war, um, um, Torak um, was, he wasn't put in, in jail because uh, the judge said, well, you have done wrong things, but you, have ha you don't have blood on your hands. So he was pardoned. He was given a fine of a few thousand uh, Deutschmark. Um, but he had not money because nobody wanted to buy anything anymore from him. So to get his son on... Uh, on school, he had to pay for it. So he offered them a third horse, which he had made. And the school said, well, we accept it. They had no idea what kind of horse it was. So they put it somewhere in a garden behind the school. And it was standing there for all these decades. And just after we found out about these two horses, when we recovered the real two horses, um, the school looked the director of the school looked in the garden and thought, oh my God, <laughs> this one looks very similar. And they investigated it and it turned out to be the third horse. A great, great story, of course. And I can see here's a question here. Um, uh, other than the horses, what was your favorite achievement? Apart from the horses? Yeah. Well, I have found quite a lot of stolen art. Um, one, one beautiful case was I was searching for a Jewish family, um, a painting stolen by the Nazis. And this woman was living in France next to the Louvre. And she, as a child, she often went to the Louvre and she heard the stories about her grandparents, a sad history. And then I found out that the painting she was searching for that was stolen from her grandparents who didn't survive the war, was hanging in the Louvre. It was recovered by after the war. It was returned to France. And the French didn't... And in the first decades after the war, nobody was, was interested to, to help these Jewish families. That's the truth. So we, we discovered this painting in the Louvre. Can you imagine? So the Louvre was... The, the, the French government uh, was embarrassed. So they made a big public event out of it to, to hand it over to, to this family. But of course, I also found um, the stolen ring of Oscar Wilde, which was a great story. Uh, it was stolen in 2002, a golden ring that once belonged to Oscar Wilde. It was stolen from Oxford. My next book will be about that story. And it was an amazing story because I adore Oscar Wilde, you know, this, this poor man who, who was born in the wrong, in the wrong time and um, who so tragically, um, his life ended so tragically. And to he was my favorite writer, and to have his ring with his initials, his golden ring, for two weeks on my hands before handing it over to Oxford, that was uh, also an amazing thing. And a Picasso that I discovered that was stolen in 1999 from a yard of, of a shaykh in, in France. After 20 years, I, I re rediscovered it. It was worth 70 million. And a day before I handed it over to the rightful owners, I put it here next to me on the wall for one night. And I sat here the whole night watching my private Picasso. And then the next day I, handed to, I had to hand it over. But that night was a re religious experience. So there are many, many stories. Um, Every story has its own beauty, you know. Every, every piece of art, if you, if you dig into it, whether it's a Picasso or the, the, the Hitler's horses or whatever, the, the Ring of Oscar Wilde, you know, art antiquities 
it's, it's such a beautiful thing. Well, it was Tom a Hayes. huge investment for you uh, of, of time, you know, to, uh, to the, 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 just this one story of the, uh, how, that, that was like, uh, you know, a big chunk of your life, wasn't it? That was a major investment for you. Absolutely. In and time and, and effort. Of, uh, you know, if that... You know, the funny thing is sometimes yes, people Yes, yes, please ask carry me, on. Sometimes people ask me, why are you successful when the FBI or other people cannot find a piece after 50 years? You do find it. And it's not because I have superpowers. I'm just a very regular guy without a driver's license. I don't even own a bicycle. I'm Dutch, Covicchio. So I'm a simple guy. But I think my, the power, my power is that, I, first of all, I never give up. And um, the second is that I don't do it for the money. Um, People always ask me, who paid you for this search for Hitler's horses? And I said, oh, God, do you really think that if I get a picture of Hitler's favorite statues thought to be destroyed 75 years ago, these famous symbolic things, do you really think that if I get a picture and I think, oh, my God, they are out there somewhere, that my first reaction is who's going to pay me? Of course not. I watch my bank account and I think, how much saving money do I have? How much can I search for it? How long can I search for it? Let's go for it. And then afterwards, of course, you sell books, you know, they make a movie. So I'm not complaining, but, you know, I don't do this for the money. It's it's the adventure. It's it's the adrenaline. It's it's meeting people, you um, out of life characters. So that's that's why I do it for. But to be honest, it's it's like working seven days a week, uh, 16 hours a day, because it never stops. There is nobody who says to me, um, it has been enough for today, uh, leave it. You know, if, if you are on the search for Hitler's horses, and, and the longer you are working on it, the, the difficult, the more difficult it becomes to, to quit, because then you think, I've, I've spent so much years already into this investigation, I can't quit now. So I'm working now on some cases already for, for seven, eight, nine years, and I'm still going strong. Well, I see we've got some very interesting suggestions for the, for actors to play you. Can you see them? I saw some of them. Pierce uh, on the screen, saw, Tom. Tom Hanks. Yes. Now, the funny thing is if, yeah, if... Daniel Craig. I think Daniel Craig would be good. No, these are all cool guys, you know, and I'm not that cool. Um, I always compare, yeah. they always say Indiana Jones of art, etc. I'm not Indiana Jones. The stories I get involved in, the adventures sometimes are Indiana Jones-like, but I'm just a normal guy. And if I should compare myself, I always compare myself to one of my heroes, uh, Peter Sellers in his role as Inspector Clouseau. I think the younger people don't know him. Just look him up, Inspector Clouseau, <laughs> Peter Sellers. Yeah. He was a French inspector, a complete idiot. Um, he did everything wrong. He all, all, always followed the wrong leads. When he uh, disguised himself, he looked like an idiot. Um, everybody thought him to be not good, but because he was so determined and he was so, um, you know, he kept on going. And with a bit of luck in the end, he was successful. So... I wish, well, Peter Sellers is not alive anymore, but uh, that would be a good one to, to play me. I think, I think perhaps a ghost playing you might be one step too far. <laughs> um, I think I would not call you a normal guy at all. Um, it has been the most amazing hour. I can't thank both of you enough. Um, Patrick, for your really amazing questions, very um, bringing out so many uh, points that we wouldn't have thought of. And even though we lost you a couple of times, uh, you came back in very smoothly and picked up where you were. So thank you so much for that. And Arthur, I mean, it's just absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Um, I hadn't quite finished the book, but I had read quite a lot of it and I, I wanted to wait to finish it to listen to you tonight. And I now look forward to, to reading it again from the start uh, now that I've met you in this way. Uh, and to uh, following the story of the development of the film, because I think that's probably going to take quite a lot of your time as well, um, as much yeah, as they... And if you're in Germany next year, you can go and, and see all these statues. They will be on display. Uh, let's hope we... 
Yes, let's hope by next year we're all going to be starting to travel again. Uh, if yeah. not, maybe they'll they'll zoom the uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> the ceremony in from there. They they that, they seem to be doing that quite a lot. Um, so thank you to the audience. Thank you so much for your questions and for your engagement in the last hour. And um, I hope we can perhaps bring you back again and hear more about your your journey and your story. Uh, which is so fascinating. Uh, thank you for joining us at JW3. Uh, please do watch our website for everything that we have going on there. And we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Take care, everyone.